Marks and Andrew was already threatening to take his T-shirt off. I think we've all, <laughs> just in the nick of time, um, uh, stopped the opening music. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. Welcome to people here physically with their bodies in the newsroom and to everybody watching online. Um, I am Liz, um, and one of the editors here. And um, I'm very interested to have this conversation because um, I, I don't quite know how I feel about Pride. Um, possibly because I'm a rubbish gay, possibly because I'm a bit old, but I'm just a bit discombobulated about it as a thing. And so I'm genuinely here to try and understand some of the mechanics um, and to hear from other people what um, pride, this massive juggernaut in many ways, um, that is a huge part of LGBT culture, not just in this country, but across the world, means to, to other people. Um, because I think I've got it wrong somehow. Um, and I'm interested to know, and we're very pleased to have Chris and Debbie here with us. And I know that there's lots of people in the audience who have strong feelings about it. This is a thinking. The whole point is you say what you think. And in the round at the end, I try and make up my mind and tell you what I think. Um, so don't hold back. We've got an hour. The tortoise on the screen will make her stately way across to the other end and she sticks a flag in the air and then we will stop. Um, I just want to ask a quick question to get us going. Hands up who's ever been to a Pride? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Most people. Um, I just want to get a sense of who ha is the most outstanding Pride veteran in the room? Chris, your first Pride was 1989, you think? Mm -hmm. Anybody been to an earlier Pride than 1989? Debbie? 86. 86. Any advance on 86? Yes, sir. 88. So, OK, but we're in the ballpark. We're in the ballpark. What's your name, sir? Chris. Two ticks off. Aye, Tim. Um, if anybody's watching online who can beat Debbie's 86 record... Please do feel free to type your year into the chat now and I will hear from you. Can I just get a sense of who went to Pride this year for the first time? Has anybody just done an, a first Pride? Put, raise your hands aloft. Don't be shy. OK, interesting. OK, right, good. So I'm going to hear a veteran story first. Debbie, 86, it's 1986. Duran Duran are in the charts. Everybody's hair is massive. Pads. Shoulder pads are huge. It's not that brilliant being gay in that, in that time of no. life. So it's a London Pride you went to? It was London Pride. I moved to London from deepest, darkest North Wales in 1984. I should say, I'm so sorry, I haven't even introduced Debbie. Debbie this is Debbie Brixey, who's chair of Oxford Pride. So this is what who Debbie is. That's why she's there. Let's carry on. Um, so yes, I was here in uh, late 84. In 86, somebody said, go to Pride. And I went, why? Mm. What? Why would I want to do that? Um, but I went, and it was the first time I'd ever been. And... It was huge. It was massive. I had no idea there were that many gay people in the world, let alone in London. Mm -hmm. And everybody came from all over. And you met people that you ne had never seen before. And you met people that went on to be friends for years and years and years to come. And it was all about community. And it was just, it was brilliant. Um, Debbie, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but, but you have been gazumped <gasps> while you were talking. <laughs> Lynn Stagg, Tortoise member extraordinaire, my good pal, who is watching from home. I can't even remember where you live, Lynn. Um, you're claiming that you were there in 74. Can it be true when you're only 35 now? <laughs> you're Hi, Lynn. extremely kind. Oh, Hello. Hi, um, yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, I think it must have been around that time because I came to London in 1971 and found Sappho and the Gateways. So yeah. I think it was probably the 70s, yes. So tell us about the Pride that you remember. What, what was it, how many people, what were you doing? I mean, not everything you were doing possibly, but- Not, not hugely <laughs> in my mind, funnily enough. It, it's strange, but I remember more uh, the late 70s, early 80s, when I started going with, um, union pals and so on but before that i'm pretty sure we went with a sappho banner at some point yeah yeah but i think that that was probably and it was probably round about then yes so and yes so you I mean, marched. I it was mainly marching oh yes oh absolutely yes yeah. no no it's political as far as i'm concerned still is 
Okay, interesting, Lynn. Um, it's lovely to see you. I'm, I might come back to you. Um, let, let me just hear from a couple of people. I know Chris Cregan, um, he put a vote in for 84 watching from home. Um, who, you put your hand up. This, this London was your first Pride. Hi, what's your name? Alistair. Hi, Alistair. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good. Tell us about Pride this year. Um, it was a bit overwhelming. Was like it? So many people. Um, but it was really amazing to kind of have that experience for the first time. I didn't really know what to expect. Yeah. Um, and to go to like one of the biggest prides was amazing because I moved here only about a year ago. Right. Um, so yeah, it was really good. I felt a little bit humbled seeing especially all of the um, particularly trans inclusive flags out there because um, of what's going on in the media right now. And yeah, it just. And what did you do? I marched. You in marched. The, in the Pride. Can anyone march? Can you just join in? No. 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 Okay. This, cause this is, shows my total ignorance, you see. So um, somebody said here's an emphatic no. Was it, was it like, uh, well, uh, let's get you a mic, sorry. Hi, what's your name, sorry? Hi, I, I'm Carrie. Um, Hi, Carrie. I'm, we're from AKT. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that over the past few years has been wristbands issued. So you march within groups that okay. you represent. So different charities and different businesses. Um, can apply to take part and then you are assigned somewhat randomly the number of places that you can have oh. um, and then you give those out to your supporters. Okay, helpful. Right, this is a ha handy time to bring in um, Chris. Christopher Joel DeShields, Executive Director for Pride in London, no less. I feel like we ought to bow down before you. <laughs> um, who has a day job and a gay job. <laughs> yep. Tell us about it, because sure. I, this blew my mind. Yeah, at, at Pride in London, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a volunteer-led organisation. So most of us will say that Pride in London is our gay job, and the do jobs that we do during the day is our day job. So that's where that reference comes from. Because it's entirely voluntary entirely. as an entity. Uh, that's correct, yes. And it's a charity. Uh, it's a CIC, so uh, okay. not charity, but a community interest Okay, uh, What's company. The, what, does, what does that mean? So a slightly practice? different in terms of we're pretty much, very much similar, uh, like a limited company, but with a community interest, so pretty much a non-profit okay. um, versus us, a charity, uh, which we're not, okay. um, which has different status. And uh, I'm interested in, in what you said about you have to apply to be part of the parade bit. Mm -hmm. What's, what are you looking for when you're assessing the applications? Is it just capacity? So basically, uh, there is an application process that goes along with the parade. Uh, there is a limitation on the numbers that we can have in the parade. Yeah. So those applications that are coming through are from LGBT plus community groups, such as AKT, and a wide range of LGBT businesses, as well as corporate entities as well. So some of the things that we're looking for during the application process is the activities that they've been doing. Well, if they're an LGBT organization, they will pretty much headline uh, what they've been doing. But for those that are not necessarily uh, LGBT um, as their front runner of their business or their organization, we will look for the work that they've been doing in the community, um, any activity that they have in terms of their employee networks, um, and what they're looking to achieve from being involved in Pride. So there is a sort of a, a judgment of their worthiness, sort of, that they're commitment to the cause, I admit, this might not be quite the right language, you're kind of assessing do they deserve to be there kind of thing. Yeah, we're looking to make sure that the space that we provide is a safe space so that yes. all of those uh, organisations and companies that are coming into the space are going to be respectful of the other organisations that are there right. um, and that they're not going to cause elements of safety risk right. or hurt to sure. those members and okay. members of the LGBT plus community. Got it. Um, and Pride in London is is big. It's mm -hmm. a if you notice it happening. You know, it's a big it's a big yeah. thing. I'm wondering what you, as the leader of that organisation, obviously there's this sort of statement of what Pride in general exists to do, mm -hmm. inclusivity, celebration, whatever. Um, what's your sort of set of KPIs? It's, it seems like a reductive question to ask, but I want to get the sort of money stuff out to begin with, and then we can talk about meaning and things like that. What are you aiming for? How do you know that this year's Pride was better than the one before, for example? Right. So in terms of KPIs, we do have a set of KPIs that come with our funding grant from the mayor's office. But okay. in terms of our, our own KPIs, it's about the community involvement that we have, what that diversity looks like, um, the impact that it has for the community, 
um, and the reach that it has. Okay. Um, and really also utilizing our campaign and the impact of that campaign um, to the cause. And how, where does the money come in and where does it go to? Sure. So the event is pretty much a, a fundraising event that we have to do. So we do get support from the mayor's office, the GLA, um, and that's in a grant of 100,000, uh, previously 100,000 pounds okay. a year. Um, all of the other funds come through fundraising. So that could be through sponsorship, uh, through companies that uh, come on board. Um, we do have an element of funds that come through parade fees. Um, and others through shaking the bucket. Got it. And then you obviously allocate out to organisations like yours, I'm, I'm imagining, LGBT charities and so on and so forth. Who, who, how do you decide who gets what? So here's my big bucket of money. I've collected it from Pride. How, what happens then? So that's slightly different. So the funds that we get in to deliver the event all go back into delivery of the event. Oh, so okay, okay. we also have what is known as the Unity Fund, which began in 2019, is where we actually uh, draw in funds from corporates, individuals yeah. who feed into a pot that we then have that <clears throat> community groups and organizations can apply for funding. Um, okay. And then we re redistribute from, Understand. from the Unity so, Fund. So to a large extent, actually, the event is the end in itself. The point is the visibility, the experience, the connection, all of those things that we've heard. That is the point of it. So yes. Okay, it, got it's it. really about raising that visibility, giving that platform for the LGBT plus community to be visible, to have their voice heard, to be that global recognition. Because if we look, the, you know, there's countries around the world where people can have a pride, where they can celebrate who they are as individuals. Yeah. And it's, you know, having the ability to provide this platform for on a global scale, you know, I think is beneficial, not just to us here in London as an LGBT plus community or nationwide, but those who sit around the world who may be watching and thinking, you know, there, there is a possibility that one day I'll be able to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And we like to be able to carry that cause and to use our voice, you know, to fight for those causes on a global scale as well. I'll come back to you about the fighting for the causes thing. Debbie, Oxford Pride, I'm surprised to hear, um, I live near Oxford, has been going for 20 years. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, not a new thing at all, and you're the chair of it now. Um, as Chris is talking about London Pride, do you nod along to all of the things? Is it the same in Oxford? Is it a sort of a carbon copy, but just in Oxford world, or is there a different agenda? No, we're, we, are, we are a protest march as much as we are a celebration march. It, it, we are there to raise voices. We've been raising voices a lot this year uh, for Ukraine. So right. we had Ukrainian flags. With, there is a, a pride flag for the, for the two main or the larger uh, two pro prides in Ukraine, and we carry those wherever we go. Mm -hmm. So we had a contingent at London. We, we marched very, very happily with the uh, Ukrainian NGOs. Um, we've marched in all our local ones and we'll be taking the flags up with us when we go to UK Pride later this week. Or marching. I was going to say, there's always a Pride. It's a bit like Horse of the Year show. It's sort of always on. Mm. Is that deliberate? Um, there's about 200 Prides in the UK. So, you know, we all have to have a weekend. We overlap these days. I mean, yeah. there didn't used to be quite so many of them. But, you know, Pride is... is both a large event and a local event. So, you know, if you are within a community, then you want to be with your community. So mm. you don't necessarily want to go to a big pride. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to necessarily have to trek into London either. Mm. Um, I'm just going to test a few people um, in the room and then please do weigh in in the chat um, if you want to. Are you putting your hand up in the air, Mark? No, no stretching. Oh, I see. So, <laughs> careful. Keep very still. Um, what? So, I, I'm not desperately interested, to be honest, in that question of is pride a celebration or a protest? Because clearly, it's both, and it doesn't have to be either or the other. I think it's a non it's a non question. But, but just d fight with me if I'm wrong about that. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, um, I'd like I'd like to know from the floor because most of you have been to a pride and uh, at various frequencies. What do you think pride is? For what? What is Pride asking for? Tell me what. what tell me what you think the answer to that question is, because I'm sure that Chris and Debbie will have strong, strong views. What, what is the sort of point? Go on, Mark. Visibility. Say more. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, and audibility for, with the mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was going to say visibility. So uh, it is a moment where um, I guess. 
in one sense, there is sort of safety in numbers. You know, lots of people who might feel disconnected from what you might call like mainstream kind of representations of society get a chance to kind of come out en masse and be seen together as a group and sort of demonstrate that, um, well, there is a kind of strength in numbers kind of thing. And this yeah. is a large community with lots of different people in it of all different shapes and sizes and ages and everything else. Um, so I, th I think it's a moment of claiming visibility. Okay, interesting. Tim, I could see when I said, I don't think that's an interesting question, you were like, yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm <laughs> the it, gobby northerner. <laughs> yeah, no, too. Oh, I'm a gobby northerner too, so we can go at it without Perfect. worrying. I just want to pick up on that point about protest that you uh, yeah. said. And I think, for me, why, why is Pride something that we do in summer? You know, used to be that Pride was just a moment of the protest that was going on all year round. Mm. And I'd argue that in 2022, it feels very much like 1988. It's coming back to haunt us. Mm. I, I work with um, LGBTQ plus youth who are 16 to 25, and what they want to see is protest. Mm. And I think, you know, we said, what is the product of pride? What's the outcome? Yeah. They're, they're, it's, it's just another pride. You know, where, where's the where is the strength and voice behind, for example, trans youth or anybody who's trans at the moment? Why aren't we use why aren't we using pride in the way that our young people want us to use it, which is going back to that protest and carrying that protest through for a whole year? Why is it stopping? Because it is the the <laughs> it's all being pulled away from us slowly and we're all, we're not trying to allow that, but we've got to step up. We've got to make pride about protest. We've got to put ourselves out there, and we've got to make sure it's a whole year. Sorry, that was a long, long No, speech. no, not at all, not at all. Yeah, there's absolutely no bloody reason carrying on. Am I allowed to say bloody? Thank yeah, you, you can say fuck if you want. No bloody reason <laughs> carry on with a celebration without unification and protest added in there. Okay, I can see Maz has got the, got the mic. Go for it. I, Maz, I you were very involved in Oxford Pride, just so the, the people know the background. Yes, I'm, I am with Debbie, a fellow director of Oxford Pride, and uh, as you described me before, I am her purple wife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, yes, we have a very Pride family. Um, going back to what Mark said, I, for me, I feel that Pride is important, particularly for young people, and for people who are coming out. We as LGBT people around the world, we are a global community, but we, d we don't have a country, we don't have a single place that, um, that we look to to bring us together as a global community. And Pride over the last 50 years has developed as that center point where people who um, are coming to terms with how they feel within themselves can look to pride as a, a single point that brings together all of the different intersectionality and diversity within the LGBTQ plus or um, SOGI-esque community. Mm. Um, and it, it's a way of finding home. Um, and I think that's what pride is important for, to give people their first opportunity to take part in pride, to come out and be overwhelmed like you were, um, and, and to, see, to see all of these people is really important. But pride is every day of the year. It isn't just at the end of June. It isn't just Pride Month in June. And um, we've found uh, in Oxford, we have a lot of young people that have put on rallies uh, for ban conversion therapy, for instance, sure. and the students are out there rallying and taking to the streets and getting their voices heard to support the trans people within our community. And that is part of Pride, but it isn't, it isn't just Pride. There, there are so many other opportunities where you can come out on the streets and have your voices heard in all of these ways. And, you know, everything evolves. So Pride is a protest still, uh, but a celebration of where we are. And, you know, we need to celebrate the victories that we've won. Mm. 
Um, thanks, uh, Maz and Tim. Please do keep putting your hands up and, and, and grabbing the mic. I'll come to you, Nina, in, in a second. I just want to unravel some, some of these things. My job as the editor is to sort of try and ask the, the, the difficult questions. And because I don't, like I say, I don't know how I, how I quite feel about it. Is it, is it possible, given the sort of um, ever-expanding nature of the umbrella, the LGBT umbrella, is it possible for any entity of this kind, a, a, an experience, an event, a brand, doesn't matter how you think of it, to make everybody feel included? Christopher, what, what do you think? Is that, is that a fool's errand, trying to do that? I think you have to admit, particularly for a large pride like London, <clears throat> that, you, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're not going to be able to make everyone happy in the community. Um, you know, we work very hard to grab that feedback from the community to involve them in the event planning and what we do. But there's still going to be an element of, I want it this way, mm. um, or no way at all. And it becomes difficult for us because those volunteers who are very much part of the community want to be able to deliver an event that is totally inclusive of everyone. But some elements of delivery we just can't deliver, either financial constraints or other, other issues that, that may creep up. But it's, you know, trying to please everyone on a large scale is not always going to work. And there will be people that will be unhappy as much as we put as best an effort forward in trying to deliver that type of fully inclusive pride. Debbie, what do you think? I'm going to agree. I mean, we, we say, everybody, welcome. Please tell us what it is that you would like from us, what, what we can add to this for you. Um, we put on events all the way through the year, and we put on different events so that we can say, you know, if you don't want to do the pride march and that whole thing, and I realize, obviously, it's really overwhelming for some people. Mm. It is huge. It is crowded. It is noisy. We have drummers, and so it's really noisy. Um, so there's lots of people who just don't want to do that part, but they want to be part of the community. And that's where your difficulty comes, is trying to find the right way to get the people who don't want to be in that bit but want to not lose out on the other. Mm. Um, we also have lots of questions about having sober spaces and things like that. Yeah. And um, more family areas. Yeah. And these are, these are always, they're, they're slightly difficult, to be absolutely truthful, because if, you're, if your venue is not huge, there are places that you can't put things because there's alcohol, for instance. So mm. you can't always do everything, but you can listen and you can try and include something every year from whatever that part was and just say, OK, let's try and do this this year and then see whether people like it. Mm. I do, um, and I'd be interested to know if anybody's ever taken their... I know, Maz, I know you have taken your um, um, Hits of Pride. But I, so I have two kids, 12 and 10, and I... I've never been myself, largely because they're only with me on a weekend and so, you know, logistics and what have you, but I wouldn't take them. Partly because I'm just an uptight parent and they're just not that type of kid, so partly there's a bit of that, but I, I, I do fear that if I were to do it, they would see something that I didn't want them to see. Now, I don't care about them seeing women kissing other women, they can see that at home, but, you know, it's... <laughs> I, I, I would be I would be worried about that that the the, the thing of it, you know you can come along and it's family friendly it isn't family friendly there are aspects there are aspects of pride that are really not family friendly and I think not okay to see and there's a part of me this like I say the sort of uptight John Lewis customer part of me not an insignificant part which is saying I don't know how much this is helping collectively all of us some of that you know kink situation if i dare say it is that okay to say what do you think I, I think i have kids myself um so i've been bringing them to pride since 2011 when they were one um getting them to understand the community that we live in having uh you know two yeah. same-sex parents but i've seen pride evolve over the years mm -hmm. so we actually have a code of conduct in terms of dress but we very much welcome the kink and the fetish community to be part of the part of the parade and I think they come you know in a manner that's respectful for and they understand the community so they come in a respectful respectful mode this year in particular I saw a, a high increase of families participating uh, in the parade itself we actually create a family space in St Giles which is sponsored and supported by uh, the Scouts and Lego 
um, really creating a space where families can go, the kids can roam free, and be in that safe space. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably something that's going to continue to grow as we see the growth of LGBT plus families in the yeah. in the um, in the community. And uh, and you know. I'm going to be biased in that I'm very much pro kids being at Pride, yeah. uh, and, and we'll continue to make it an event, you know, that is family oriented, mm -hmm. um, and that kids can enjoy. Um, they can enjoy themselves. They can enjoy the families that they're with, and they can enjoy other kids, you know, who may have the same experience of being from same-sex families, yeah, yeah. or kids are, are finding themselves at such a young age now, 10, 11. I remember in 2019, I was in the family area, and I think there was an 11-year-old on the stage. And uh, I only caught the tail end of what she was saying, and I realized that she was saying that she was so proud to be here because her family had brought her because she had just come out to her family. And she was 11 years old, and she was in a kid's space. Mm. So it was a safe space yeah. for her. So, you know, it was that moment that I realized that, you know, this space is important, and we mm. need to continue to grow it, and we need to have families involved. Mm. Interesting. Um, I feel like I can see hands twitching, but you might need to be slightly bolder. Steph at the back, and then Nina, I know you wanted to say something as well. <laughs> Steph, did you, did you go to Pride this year? Yes, I First did. First Pride? Yes. First London Pride. First London Pride. Okay, so tell Biggest me about one. previous Prides. Reading Pride once. Okay. Um, Any good? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it was about six years ago, so I'm going to forgive them Okay, for okay. <laughs> um, but I think it's a really interesting point between family and kink at Pride, because I'm very much pro both of them being at Pride, but how do you make that distinction between, okay, well, kids kind of probably shouldn't necessarily, who are eight years old, be exposed to a lot of the kink and fetish community because there's this whole, we're trying to fight back against this argument of, well, kids shouldn't come out with fetishizing kids by showing them gay stuff. And yeah. it's just kind of, how do you balance balance the kids' needs and the family's needs and showing them that there are other people like them with uplifting the kink and fetish community who are also a massive part of the queer community. Um, and without them, Pride would not be where it is today. I don't know the, I don't know the answer. Nick. Yeah, I would like a straight answer from you now, please, Liz. If you're part, <laughs> if you're part I can't give you a straight answer on anything. I can only give gay answers, unfortunately. Oh. Lena. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for supporting Ukraine. I'm from Ukraine. And uh, as for me, if I saw Ukrainian flag in the big crowd of London Pride, mm. I would accept it as a support, not just for LGBTQ plus community in Ukraine, but to the whole Ukraine, right? Mm. I just wanted to tell you how it happens in Ukraine. Like the first Pride in Kyiv uh, happened so that nobody except its participants knew where it could be. I was in charge of the BBC Ukrainian service at that time, and we couldn't even know where to send the correspondent because these people were so afraid that some small homophobic groups, I'm not saying about the, like, all the society was homophobic, but mm -hmm. there were some people who could sure. say, like, we will come and beat you. So they changed a few times the location. It was a very small event surrounded with a few rows of police just in case. Through a few years, it developed in a big march, and they didn't, they didn't use the term gay parade or pride. They said the equality march, which became a big event uh, to protect and to defend human rights, including feminist, women's rights. Uh, so if you are LGBTQ, you go to the equality march. If you are feminist, male or female, you go to the march. If you are for Istanbul Convention uh, ratification against the domestic violence, you go to the march. It became a big event, and uh, in a few years, the um, attitude to LGBTQ plus community changed in Ukraine in a very positive way. Um, I wouldn't say all the society is very positive, but the trend is really, really very positive. And finally, it resulted in that we all signed the petition at the website of our president to, um, to acknowledge uh, same-sex marriage. Mm. Uh, because there are a lot of people, I mean, maybe up to 10% of our army are the people from LGBTQ plus community, and it is not about having s sex with the person of same sex with you. 
It's about the, you know, when the person is uh, injured, when the person is in intensive care therapy, if the person is killed, these are legal questions. This is not about relations, just relations, yeah? So I think it's a very positive thing that we have this uh, attitude that this is not just about some community, this is about human rights and it played a huge role in uh, all aspects of uh, our yeah. life. Yeah, thanks ever so much um, Nina and Tommy is commenting um, in the chat about the political solidarity impact which probably I un under um, think about or, 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 or don't remember enough. Um, is Mark Simpson in the telly? Hi, Mark. Yes, hello, Liz. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Nice to see you. Mark um, was brilliant on our um, Top Gun thinking that we did oh, a, a few you. weeks ago. Um, Mark, y y when was your first Pride? Oh, well, that's uh, giving away too much information, isn't it, really? Uh, <laughs> Give us a decade. About 85, 85 okay. or something. So, so I'm, I'm that old. What, what, do you, what do you make of it? of it now because uh, you know we've said you know obviously all social justice so social justice movements evolve pride has become this enormous entity as debbie said there's 200 of them up and down the country as someone who's been a sort of involved in it to varying degrees over the years wh what do, how do you make of the trajectory well um i should say that you know when i went in the 80s <clears throat> and by the way i think in 85 yes in 85 the male, the gay male age of consent was still 21. Yeah. yeah. Um, as just one example of the <clears throat> legal yeah. discriminations that were going on at the time. Um, and I, uh, as a very young man, I, I found it um, a very useful uh, and uh, energizing experience. Um, it was more of a march back then mm -hmm. um, and had more of the, um, I think there was still, you know, some of the original gay lib politics involved yeah. in, in Pride at that time. Um, but by the 90s, the late 90s, me and Pride sort of parted ways. Um, it really wasn't for me anymore. Um, perhaps because I didn't need it anymore. Perhaps that was just a very selfish uh, point of view of mine. Um, but I think it, it also, or perhaps more, had to do with the fact that it was becoming um, a very American style uh, event, which again, you know, lots of people enjoy uh, and that's fine, but I think that the, the uh, basically sort of identity politics was was really beginning to take root in the late 90s. Um, and I haven't paid a great deal of attention since then to Pride. Um, and Pride hasn't paid much attention to me. Um, but, you know, I, I thought I better look some stuff up before I come on your show about, you know, what, what is Pride. And um, it's interesting that when you look it up on, online, you find, you know, on Wikipedia, that the, um, there's a lot of mentions of Stonewall, the, the Stonewall riots at a bar, uh, a, a gay bar um, in New York in yeah. 1969. Yeah. And um, well, although now this is officially rebranded, you know, it was, it was a riot, but now you're supposed to call it an uprising, um, which seems like a, uh, a you know way to ruin a perfectly good bar riot. Um, <laughs> but but it's interesting that nobody has mentioned. I, I, I'm, the sound isn't great. Perhaps somebody did, but I didn't hear anybody talking about the Stonewall riots, which is what Pride historically is supposedly commemorating. Um, but I think part of the reason for that is because it has grown so much um, 
I mean, pride seems to be, one way of looking at it is that pride seems to be about flags. There's over 50 pr pride flags for each uh, different identity when you look it up online. Um, and I, I found on, on the Volvo uh, company website, because it, it needs to be mentioned that the pride is a very corporate business these days. I don't mean the, the wonderful volunteers who do all of their, their, their work uh, uh, for free. Um, I mean, the way that banks and corporations buy into pride now um, to show us how wonderful they are. Um, and on the Volvo website, there's uh, you, lists the uh, various pride frags. And um, because it's alphabetical, the first one that comes up is the abro sexual pride flag. And there's a definition of what amounts to abrosexuality. And the definition is um, abrosexual refers to an individual whose sexuality is changing or fluid. For example, someone could be gay one day, then be asexual the next, then polysexual the next. While it is possible and even common for a person's sexual identity to shift or change in some way throughout their life, an abrosexual person's sexuality may change more frequently over the course of hours, days, months, or years. Because of their inconsistent attraction, some abrosexual people may not feel compelled to seek out a relationship or may prefer a waivership. I'm not really sure what a waivership is, but the point that I'm driving at here is that, that in its desire to incorporate uh, as, as, as many different minorities as possible and identities as possible. You know, that plus at the end of all those letters is there in case you've forgotten one of those identities, the unknown God. Um, it's descended into incoherence. I mean, uh, <laughs> An abrosexual, and there are lots of other similar sounding identities in the list, um, isn't something that really, it, 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 it has no definition. It's, it's an anti-definition. Mark, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there because I want to pick up on some of these um, points. Um, and thank you to Mark for sort of bringing it. I want to go on, I want to go on banks and I want to go on scope creep. And I want to go a little bit on um, what Mark is talking about. And I think as a sort of ordinary person in the world, there is a difficulty. And part of the reason why I'm discombobulated about it is because the actual thing of pride, the thing that you look after and that you look after and that we all, or not me, but you have all been to and experience um, is is it's a sort of smorgasbord of different things. And the word pride hasn't has because the world is the world and the internet is the internet. Lots and lots of other things have become attached to that um, entity, whatever it may be, set of flags, words, terms, and things like that. And so it becomes a sort of a, a, a mush of stuff. And arguably the point of it then gets diluted, which in all fairness, however brilliant you, you are, I'm sure, I'm sure you are, you, you're, you can't unravel all that stuff. It's not what you're, what you're here to do. So I'm kind of interested to know, let's do banks first. We all have a bit the ick when you see on LinkedIn, suddenly on the 1st of June, all the logos go rainbow and you kind of suspect that these might not, some of them I'm sure are incredible places to work if you are part of the community and sometimes perhaps not. As the, as the man whose name is above the door of Pride London, how do you feel about some of those perhaps slightly cynical branding choices? I think when we look at Pride <clears throat> and we look at what the corporates play in terms of delivery for Pride in London and helping us to keep it a free event, um, banks in particular who have sponsored us over the number of years, and when we look behind that, the really what's driving you know that raising of the lgbt rainbow flag whichever flag it is yeah. 
is the LGBT plus networks, the yeah, employee in, networks. Inside the yeah. businesses, yeah. Agreed. And they are the ones that are usually driving the participation into the Pride event. They're usually campaigning for that visibility. They're usually campaigning for their employers mm. to support that vehicle of their visibility and their voice. So I think, <clears throat> I'm not gonna say every organization beyond banks yeah. that raise a flag is genuine. Mm. Um, you know, there are some things that I've thinking I'm just saying, oh my goodness, that's absolutely ludicrous. But from my role and what I've seen and the engagement that I've had with some of the larger banks and really from some of the other organizations is the drive from the networks. And I think, you know, employers are now stepping up and realizing that, you know, LGBT lives are very much an important part of the community. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going away. It's allowing them to let their employees come to work and be their authentic selves, mm -hmm. you know, and it sends a message to employees, mm -hmm. you know, I can come in, I can be myself, I can be celebrated for who I am. I know my organization will support Pride when I'm out there marching or participating in any of the events up and down the country. Not everybody sees that, everybody thinks that it is about just that pink washing. Um, and it's really, you know, for us, we do a level of vetting of, of uh, organizations that are, uh, that are sponsoring us as, as a um, strategic partner. But it's also, you know, making sure that the work that they do is really supporting those LGBT plus employees and also making sure that, you know, they're going beyond their employees and actually supporting those in the community as well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what it's like for Oxford in terms of your sponsors, but... Well, I'm not a big fan of pink washing, I will be truthful. I have been known to complain about it quite a lot. Um, but what we do find is the people that are tending to approach us at the moment, they are people who've got their own LGBT networks, but they're also people who've got really robust diversity and inclusion things going on all the time. And we've had a lot of conversations about this year with people saying, can you come in and talk to us? Can you have a conversation? What should we be doing better? Yeah. And if they're asking that question, I feel slightly heartened that they're, yeah. that they're not pinkwashing. Yeah. I think some are just, let's slap a rainbow on it and look, we've done our job, and that I don't like them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, arguably, rather it's there than not. Than not. Um, I, I get that. Um, I'll come to you in a second, Mark, if that's OK. Let's talk about scope creep then, because part of this is a structural thing in that pride isn't one thing with one, you know, Mr or Mrs Pride looking after it. You know, there's quite a complex setup in terms of policy decisions and how it's executed and who gets a wristband and how much it costs and is it a pop concert or is it all of that stuff is sort of devolved in the for, for good reason um but then there's this question of who really feels it's for them and how do you i mean that's that's a real question about whether everybody feels welcome and and, and i take the point and the, the one that steph echoed too which is as an event organizer my God, you can't please everybody. It's incredibly difficult. It has to be safe. All of that stuff is very real. But sort of politically, how do you navigate that as an organisation as well, in terms of fe people feeling that it is for them? For us as, as an organisation, one of the things that we do is we do surveys as well, in re beyond the uh, community listening. So when we build our campaign, it's really built on what the community have told us they want. So in if we look back to 2019, we had the Jubilee. So that really focused on uh, the Stonewall riots and, and the progress of the LGBT plus movement uh, from that point on. If we look at what we delivered this year, it was all our pride. And that was really focused on the evolution of pride in the UK. So really beginning with the Gay Liberation Front and what they did in that first march over 50 years ago. So our campaign was really built about looking at the achievements that we had, recognizing that pride was a protest and remains a protest. And that was fed in a lot of our messaging, a lot of our visuals and what the campaign actually stood for. Mm -hmm. And then when we came to all our pride, it was really saying, you know, this is a pride for everybody to belong to. It doesn't matter of your sexual orientation or your gender identity, this is a place for you. It can be difficult trying to <clears throat> maneuver about the politics. Um, and, you know, we have to recognize that we are also an event organizer. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it was also raised about pride going beyond June. And for us, we believe in that. And, you know, our way of continuing to do that is to work with 
partners in terms of delivery of events beyond June and July when we have our event, but also continue to use our platform as a, as a means of putting out and supporting those communities and supporting those other prides that are coming up throughout the throughout the year as well. It can be difficult uh, of a challenge for us because we are volunteer led. So, you know, yeah. our volunteers, you know, like we're delivering this big event in July and you, you know, don't push us too much because it could be a burnout for, for them. So mm -hmm. we look at small ways to be able to yeah. support the continuation of Pride on yeah. a 365. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Did you just put your hand up? And in the front row as well? Yes. Let's go to the front row as well in the comfy chair. Hi, sir. What's your name? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Kevin, uh, Hi, Kevin. Director of Marketing and Comms at AKT. I think, you know, when we reflect across a pride starting from stolen on rights and where it's, where it's evolved to and will continue to evolve, I think maybe the question that we're asking is probably not the right one. Because as an umbrella of communities, we are continuously evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not to say that a lot of the small intersections that are now actually confident enough to be able to be counted was not there 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. It's the fact that through technology and the confidence, they're now being able to be visible. You know, sometimes you look in, on online and you see images of sort of like gay couples way back before it was even, you know, when it was yeah. right. Yeah. So for us to not acknowledge that they existed in that form to say, well, we don't really understand all of these pluses that are now coming up. They were always there. And I think because of that, the evolution of pride now probably stands to, back to your question, also back to you, Maz, is it something that we need to be looking at in one particular moment, or is it something that we need to be looking at across the countries? We have 200 prides. You know, I also have a startup, and you know, part of that research, you know, you go out there and you look at stuff. The LGBT community worldwide, if you put us all together, we would be the fourth largest GDP as a country. Hmm. Why are we still struggling to understand and still struggle that we can, we're still fighting for trans rights, we're still fighting here and we're still fighting there. We have 1.5 million people who descended in London for London Pride. How mm -hmm. much of those have we been able to convert to say, well, great as a celebration, but next week we're at number 10 because our trans brothers and sisters are getting a fucking backlash. And if you could turn up 1.5 to celebrate what someone first started 10, 15, 20, 50 years ago, you owe it to those that came mm -hmm. before you to stand. And I think that's where we're not seeing that collective transition, which is probably back to Tim's point of, we're going back to the 80s again. It's just like, we've become so focused on this celebration that we forgot the reason of why we started yeah. in terms of that protest. So maybe it's a question of, how do we look at combining those together? Protest is great. I'm not a protester. I'm a business person. So for me, while the protest is outside, I'll be inside talking. Do you hear those voices? They're not going away. Because here's the list of what they want. Mm. And if you don't give it to them in 24 hours, we're going to start with this company, that company, and we withhold our funds until you give it to us. Because we're the fourth largest GDP. And companies need cash flow. So if we stop buying one of your products for a month, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. going to have to go back into mm -hmm. the bank and get some more fucking money. Yeah. So that's my role, where someone else's role is. I'm there with a the placard and I'm outside yeah. and I'm pushing that. Yeah. And I think those two need to combine, but then we also need to take it one step further. We have 200 pride networks. Some prides have the benefit of being heavily funded. Are we challenging the corporates that we're working with to say, well, great that you can work with us. What about Oxford? What about Reading? What about Lucian? What about all those other smaller ones? Because until we can get to a point where we have that as a strong network, and that's what Stonewall Riots had. Mm. They had a network of mm. people who were mm. willing to use the position and privilege that they had to share it across the board so that when one person moved forward, the entire line moved. Mm. And I think we've kind of strayed a little bit from that. Mm. So mm. That, I mean, maybe feels more disparate. just as, as a concept of not just what's the future of pride, what's the future of us as communities. Collectively, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank you so much, the great points. I'm going to bring Poppy in because she's made a great point in the chat. I think she's at home. Um, Poppy's one of my colleagues here at Tortoise. See there, Poppy? Poppy S hyphen M for the people looking for her in the list. 
Hi. Hi, Poppy. Hi. Let's drop this on you. I'm loving the rebrand oh, idea. Pardon? I'm loving the rebrand idea. Oh, you do? You like yeah. it? I was really, I was worried. I thought, I thought, <laughs> I, I didn't know if you would, but yeah, I, I, I would, I would, I would really enjoy that, I think. Tell us about it, because the people in the room haven't seen what you've suggested. Well, no, I just thought it would be really fun to rebrand Pride as shame. I think it would just be more honest, less kind of leisure <laughs> pressure, just really fun. To, I think I would be more likely to attend if it was called shame. <laughs> Have you ever been, Poppy? I think I went when I, I think I went before I was gay. I might have gone. Um, <laughs> But I don't maybe think I have. Been. Maybe that's what caused it all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I think, think I've been since. Maybe, maybe I, that appeals to me as well. Maybe there's something in, um, yeah, up, uptight lesbians not wanting to go to Pride, but we're there for an <laughs> event called Shame. Yeah, <laughs> that's another thinking. Mark, you were going to say something. Uh, Where's the? Where have we got the mic, Mark? We're into the last few minutes now, so if you've got something you want to say, it's burning in your mind. Please do. Now is the hour. Um, I guess it, it, it's kind of related to some of the things that, that were said earlier, but I feel like there was a point in the sort of early, mid-2000s where some of the prides got super big, super fast, Brighton, Manchester, and they became pop concerts. I think Brighton is two days now, I think, and that's absolutely terrifying. And so I kind of, I guess the open-ended question I've got is, is there a point where it becomes too big to manage? So it's not actually about, oh, you're trying to represent all these different people and the messages are getting lost. It's that the, the beast itself is just so big, people can't actually see it for what it is mm. because all they see is Ariana Grande on stage or yeah. Britney Spears or whoever else has appeared. So I kind of wonder, is there a point, and to the point about helping some of the smaller prides, is there like a sweet spot size? Mm where it's just the right amount of people with just the right amount of spectators where it can get you the can message across. You can land some political punches, you can yeah. do the collective thing. Exactly. Is, that's, a, that's a thought. Is that something you think about when you're trying to build? Debbie, what do you think with Oxford Pride? How many people go to Oxford Pride? Um, about 10,000. Okay, so it's always tiny. Yeah. <laughs> in comparison. What do you think about that point? That is, is it, does it get so big that in the end you are just live aid and we're not doing anything? Well, one of my bones of contention, we, we had a large act, which I'm not going to name, um, on hey, stage man. a few years ago. No, I'm not going to. I love them dearly. Um, but it completely changed the dynamics of our event because lots and lots of people came to see that act. They didn't come because they were interested in pride. They didn't come because they were from Oxford. They came to see this act and they camped in front off the stage until that act came on, and it completely skewed it. So I keep having this argument with members of my committee who are going, we're going to need to put so-and-so on from Drag Race. And I'm like, do we? Mm. Do we actually need to do that? Are we about the quality of what's on the stage? And this year, we had lots of local people on, and that was great. Or are we about putting a big name on this so that everybody goes, ooh, look at us? Yeah. Which is it? It's the first one. It's about the local people. It's about the community. It's about giving back. Manchester had that problem where it raised something like four million in revenue the year Ariana Grande was on. It raised but that four, sounds brilliant. Yeah, four million, four million, in, million in, revenue. in revenue, but then they gave something like one hundred twenty-five thousand to local charities. Oh, I see, because it cost three and a half million to put it on. Got it. Did you have your hand up there as well? Hi, yeah. What's your name? I'm Alex. Hi, Alex. Um, I just kind of wanted to make a distinction. Sometimes when I think about the LG LGBT community. I then think it's really different to the LGBT community. And I just feel like there are two, two groups, really. You can look at people that identify as LGBT plus, and then you can look at people that actually are within, like working within the specific LGBT, LGBT plus community. And to me, it sometimes feels like two different kinds of groups. So I'll use the example of my sister who is also gay mm. and, myself i'm also queer but we go we live our lives well we're very close but we live our lives in terms of being lgbt very differently mm. in that she has a wife and she likes to attend pride and she likes the party aspect but then i'm very focused i like to attend pride and i love the party but i'm also very focused on the politics as well mm. so i think we just kind of need to acknowledge that not all lgbt people will be involved in pride in the same way and we can 
we can want them to be and we can try and encourage them to be, but I don't think it's realistic that everyone that is LGBT is going to want to be involved in the politics, mm. but we still have to encourage them as much as they can, mm. I think. I, yeah. And my sister attended um, her first protest that was outside of Pride with me this year because of that. Did because of the time at the protest. Yeah, I think so. Great day out. Love a protest. Um, thank you very much and, and a great point. I can see that the tortoise has waved um, her little flag aloft. I'm going to try and pull some of this stuff together. I, I found it very um, y y help clarifying, actually, and helpful for myself. Um, so <laughs> that's a good use of your evenings. Um, <laughs> but what I was going to say is um, that, that we are here to try and make, make sense of this stuff. And I think it is clear that not everybody feels clear about pride, what it's there for, what it does. I think that's OK. That's probably my first conclusion for the, for the evening. Um, I guess the second thing to say that I, that I think is worth remembering, for somebody like me who lives, you know, works in this right on newsroom in central London and is blissfully free most of the time in 2022 in the UK of, you know, r real discrimination and, and challenges for, for um, my sexual orientation, it's good for me to remember that Ukraine flag in the middle of the, of the parade. Um, to remember, you know, pride is there to do all the fun things that we know it is there for and not to diminish those, to your point in the beginning, overwhelming though it can be, but how wonderful too, but that there, there, is a, there, are, there are people who are not in this position that I am in and the least I can do is sort my childcare out and get myself down there and join in, frankly. And the third thing I think probably to say, it's a sli slightly private um, conclusion, but do you know what? Pride is a great catalyst for amazing telly. There is such amazing gay telly that has, I've noticed it this year more than any other year. And if you haven't watched The Gateway's Grind on, if, I think it's in Netflix, it might be in the BBC, I can't remember. It's absolutely amazing. Do watch it. I cried so much all the way through. Um, but there's something about um, your own relationship with this thing, whatever it might be, is somehow related to your own relationship with the person that you are. And so if that is fraught, then this is also going to be fraught. But that is not Christopher's problem to solve. <laughs> so with that in mind, or indeed Maz's or Debbie's, with that in mind, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm sure there's a Pride this weekend somewhere on, so maybe let's all go. The UK Pride. UK Pride, there you go. Awesome. Let's all go to it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to Mark, who joined from, from home, and to everybody who joined in. Um, I've loved it. Thank you very much. See you again tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>